Good morning. I'm Parag Khanna, a senior research fellow here at the New America Foundation and author of The Second World, Empires and Influence in the New Global Order. The conclusion is that, in fact, Europe and China and America are already, should be thought of as superpowers, not that America is the one dominant uh, hegemon in the world and everyone else is subservient to it, but rather, if you think of influence more broadly beyond just military power, but to look at economic and diplomatic factors and also cultural uh, affiliations, you'll find that already China and Europe are almost as influential, if not as influential as America, in many parts of the world today. I think a very good example of that is probably Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a country where America has had a very strong strategic presence uh, militarily, of course, a uh, very strong role in developing its oil industry, and we've considered it a, basically a regional anchor and ally of the United States for several decades. Today, you find that after the Gulf War, the pressures that uh, the regime has faced, um, and after, of course, 9-11, and the fact that many of the hijackers came from Saudi Arabia, if you take together all of the political sensitivities, you have a situation where the United States has more or less vacated uh, the country militarily. Uh, it's pulled to uh, Bahrain, Qatar, and other locations. And importantly, it's also a country where America's share of the total investment has diminished uh, quite substantially due to um, the rise of Europe and China. I think Americans are starting to understand that they can't get their way everywhere, but I don't think that the second and third steps, the second step being figuring out why they can't get their way everywhere, and the third step being realizing that we have very powerful rivals and understanding how they operate, uh, those second and third steps haven't quite been fleshed out and developed by American leaders, policymakers, analysts, and so on. That's the gap that I'm trying to fill, actually, with this book. And one finds that where we are sort of performing well, it's a result of not having just a political relationship with the regime, not having just a military relationship with an army, uh, but rather having a full spectrum of ties that involve everything from education, um, government governance assistance with human rights, uh, military, economic, political, and so on. A broad kind of uh, engagement with that country, its state, and its society. Geography does matter a great deal. Um, I believe that the world is sort of sorting itself out into what are called pan regions, these hemispheric zones. You find that despite the animosity between America and its Latin American neighbors um, you know, to the south, and Hugo Chavez, and even the rise of China and its growing role with the Brazilian economy and other countries in Latin America, it still is a hemisphere that is dominated economically, militarily, and otherwise by America. And I think that over time, as relations improve between the U.S. and Latin America, for a variety of reasons, um, such as energy interdependence and, uh, and trade and so on, one will find that more or less the U.S. Uh, hemispheric control will, will sort of hold, even if the so-called Monroe Doctrine is dead. So, of course, there are ex exceptions, and there will be exceptions in all the hemispheres. There will be a lot of crisscrossing. Globalization does diminish the importance of geography, but ultimately one finds the numbers showing that there is something of these, th something to this notion of pan-regional blocks forming in terms of trade and other kinds of alliances. But that will be just a, a superficial framework almost because the competition beneath the surface will, will be very intense.